take a moment to just introduce myself. Uh, I have a PhD in high energy physics from Stanford. I also graduated from Caltech, taught at Harvard, and uh, when I discovered that I couldn't make any money doing that, <laughs> I went into industry and uh, ended up running a high tech company. I see a lot of you that I recognize from previous classes and I love you for coming. And I hope when my bad jokes come up, you'll recognize them and get everybody to laugh <laughs> and all the help I can get. And for those that invested in my first book, I want to let you know that it won an award. It was selected as the best general science book of 2009 by USA Best Books. Wow. So you have a collector's item. And I just finished uh, my second book, which is the subject of today's talk. So. Um, and I just happen to have a couple copies with me. <laughs> so if you want to support my lovely wife, <laughs> I never see the money anyway. <laughs> okay, so today's topic is, can life be merely an accident? And it's sort of a strange title. So uh, we all know that life is really something very special. It's very different than anything else that exists in the universe. And the question for today is, what are the odds that this special creation could have come to exist purely by random chance? Now, in 1952, a very famous experiment was done by the Nobel laureate Harold Urey. In fact, he won the Nobel Prize uh, for work that's related to this. And uh, his junior scientist, Stanley Miller, and what they did was they put gases into a flask that matched the gas composition that people at the time thought represented what the early Earth was like. So lots of methane, uh, water vapor, no oxygen. And they exposed this gas to an electric spark, and then they cooled the material down, and they heated it up, and they pumped the stuff back and forth through the reaction chamber and after a few days, they found this colored stuff in the bottom of the flask, this brown muck. And this brown muck turns out to be full of organic materials, full of amino acids, which up until that point, no one knew how amino acids could be created. So they demonstrated that amino acids could have been created on Earth through purely natural processes like heat, cold, and electric discharge, lightning, uh, with the gases that were thought to exist at that time. Now since then we know that amino acids are formed in all kinds of places in the universe that are even <coughs> stranger than this. They form on asteroids, they form on gas clouds and nebula, and so in fact nature produces lots of amino acids just by purely natural processes. Since then, uh, chemists have shown that they can make proteins in test tubes. They can even make nucleic acid base pairs in test tubes, which are the fundamental unit ingredient of DNA. But no one has yet made DNA in a test tube. So the question is, how likely is it that we can get all the way to life by these purely physical processes? Well. The Nobel laureate George Wald, professor of biology at Harvard, uh, referencing the Uri Miller experiment, said that uh, life was certainly, had certainly arisen by the accidental interaction of molecules, the right <coughs> molecules banging together in the right way. And he said that however improbable, given enough time, and he was thinking in terms of two billion years, it will certainly happen. However improbable, given enough time, it will certainly happen. We only have to wait, and it is time that performs the miracles. Now, this is not the opinion of all scientists, but it certainly represents the opinion of most scientists. This is what I would call the conventional wisdom. And obviously there's no direct evidence that this is true, because no one was there to record the actual event. But this is what most scientists will tell you is the reason for the origin of life. Uh, on the other hand, there are others who disagree, and one of the most famous of those is Sir Fred Hoyle, who's a British astrophysicist, uh, uh, was, he's now deceased, and he is uh, perhaps most famous for coining the term Big Bang, 
but he also said that for life to occur by accident is as unlikely as assembling a 747 with a tornado crashing through a junkyard. <laughs> Actually, I did a little math, and the 747, I think, is a little bit more complicated than creating a bacteria, but, you know, it's the right idea. So the question is, which of these two scientific points of view really holds water? And uh, although science has had the conventional wisdom <coughs> that life was formed by accident for at least 50 years, there is no direct proof for that. And to my knowledge, there has never been a comprehensive mathematical analysis of that probability. And uh, I believe I've done that, and so I want to present to you the results of that. But first, let's talk about all the conditions that are necessary in our universe uh, to allow for the possibility of the existence of any form of life whatsoever at any time in the history of the universe, at any place in the history of the universe, in, in the great expanse of the universe. So what are the absolute necessary conditions for any form of life? And I will uh, divide those into four basic categories. One is you need to have a viable universe itself. It has to have the right geometry, and it has to produce stars and other things. Uh, in addition, you have to have the atoms that life requires, principally carbon, oxygen, phosphorus, iron, and so forth. And that is also uh, a remarkably difficult process. Next, you have to have a viable habitat. Uh, perhaps a planet like the Earth. So how special is Earth? Are there billions of Earths in the galaxy, or is there just one? And lastly, there has to be some sort of a biochemical process that defines what it is that this living organism is and how to build it. Because we all start from a single cell, and uh, we get to be very large, <coughs> complicated uh, Structures. There are 10 trillion cells in your body. There are 6 billion, billion, billion atoms in your body. And it all started from something incredibly small. So the DNA in your body is not just a definition of who you are. It's a blueprint for building you, basically from scratch. <coughs> so that's a really incredible process. And that has to be completely encoded. All the information necessary for that has to be completely encoded in something. Uh, the only thing we know of is a genetic code like DNA. But there has to be some means of encoding life. So let's talk about these four categories uh, and start with the universe. Now perhaps Einstein was the first to make this an important topic of scientific discussion. What he said near the end of his life was, what really interests me is whether God had any choice in the creation of the universe. Einstein was someone who definitely believed in a divine power, although he wasn't uh, a member of any specific religious organization. He hated organizations of all sorts, including religious, academic, and political. But he certainly did believe that the universe had been created by God. And he wondered if God could have made the universe very different, or whether it really had to be the way we see it. So the question that I think Einstein was trying to raise is, do the laws of physics and math, perhaps even laws we haven't discovered yet, require that a universe be pretty much the way we see our universe? Or could a universe be radically different from ours? And if the second is true, then Einstein would have wondered why God chose this particular set of conditions for our universe. Well, it's 50 years since Einstein died. And in that time, science has certainly advanced and learned a lot. And we now know that there are about 20 parameters that define a universe. And each of these represents a range of choices. So you can think of these as 20 knobs. So just like your oven has a knob that controls the temperature, and maybe another knob that controls the cooking time, and another knob that has to do with the preheat, there are 20 knobs that define a universe. And it turns out that you could set the knobs to more or less any value, and then press enter, and out would pop a universe. And it would meet all of the laws of physics and math. 
But it also turns out that even though each of these knobs has a very large range of possible values that are allowed, only in a very small range of each of these 20 knobs would it be possible for life to exist in that universe. So our universe, without question, is precisely tuned by some mechanism to allow life to exist. There's no question about that. That's a scientific fact. 